and see so many wonderful friends and colleagues for many years. So first I'd like to define biophotons. We're really talking about the ultra-weak visible light between 400 and 700 nanometers that is emitted by all living organisms. To be distinguished from the infrared light, which of course we're emitting about 100 watts of, um, this is extremely low level light on the order of you know, uh, somewhere between zero and about 100 photons per second per square centimeter of tissue. And there are two views on this light. The dominant worldview holds that this light is nothing more than a waste. It's a byproduct of the free radical chemistry within the body and doesn't have any uh, significance uh, except to be emitted as waste energy. But there is an emerging worldview in which a growing number are seeing, and, and they do call them biophotons in this case, uh, this energy as bioinformational, perhaps involved in bioregulation of the organism, and even biocommunication between organisms. Many years ago, um, unofficially, I did an experiment that convinced me there might be something here, and I'll just tell you briefly what it is. I was um, working with Drosophila fruit flies, and I put 50 male fruit flies in one vial, 50 female fruit flies in another vial, and 25 male and 25 female fruit flies in a third vial, and I measured the light. <laughs> and I found much more light emanating from the vial of male and females. So I don't believe that it's just metabolic waste. It might be involved in biocommunication. It suggests that. And today we're talking about different experiments. Uh, both Harry and I spent some time um, working with Dr. Fritz Popp, in Germany who coined the word electromagnetic bioinformation, uh, meaning that this energy is, is, the, is possibly bioinformational coming from living things. And Fritz uh, pioneered the idea that the light went coherent. Now the light is low level, but he found that the kinetics of the light emitted, if it followed a Poissonian distribution, they were random individual events, that would be a sign of the coherence of the light. Whereas if the, the decay pattern was exponential, that would be a sign that it was the chemiluminescence according to the biomedical worldview. And for the most part, his lab found coherent light. And I spent some time there and we also could distinguish organic alfalfa sprouts from commercial ones solely by this factor, which was interesting. And, and so I think there are, would be many applications both diagnostic as well as possibly therapeutic, which haven't really been born yet as far as I know. Th these, th these studies creep forward only because funding is, uh, there's quite a lack of funding. The previous studies on humans are pretty slim. There's studies on single human beings emitting light, uh, especially from the palms of the hands and the fingertips, but nobody's ever looked at or at least published studies of humans interacting. And that's where we come in today. Um, there is some literature, I'll just mention a couple of interesting uh, papers. One was a dissertation by Eugene Wallace at California Institute for Human Science down in Encinitas. And he looked at people who intended to uh, heal in a Faraday cage. It was just looking at the hand and measuring, counting photons from the palm of the hand in the case where they were intending to heal versus doing mental arithmetic as a control, and found an increase in light uh, emission that was factors of 100 to 1,000 in the healing uh, condition. And uh, Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama in Japan has me measured light coming from the crown of the head and the palm of the hand by advanced meditators and also found that during the meditation state, the light also increases. So here's some pieces of evidence that maybe it's not just junk as the mainstream thinks. Uh, the GDV, the gas discharge visualization camera from Russia invented by Dr. Karatkov is something else we've used in our laboratory to look at light, but this is an induced light because we're using a very high voltage um, electrophotographic technique where the fingertip is placed on uh, say 15,000 volts um, um, signal and then a corona discharge occurs. It's the Curlian effect, basically, in a digital camera. And studying um, energy therapies, uh, therapists who are in the act of giving energy or, or sending it by sheer will and intention, 
we see much more intense light and even sparks as shown uh, here around those corona discharges, whereas in the resting state, it looks rather uniform and is much less intense. So this also suggests that there's something going on and possibly it's involved with the biofield therapies, modalities such as therapeutic touch, Reiki, medical qigong, healing touch. There are many of these today. And that's one of the things our laboratory has been investigating. These things rem remain outside of the mainstream and considered basically placebo effects, but because we don't understand the modus operandi for how they work, but we're trying to explore that and, and show an energetic connection. So in our first study, um, I should say we, we started, we had to build a biophoton chamber because you can't just go out and buy one of these. You can buy the photo detector, but you need to set up a chamber that's completely dark in which to house the subjects during measurements. And Harry will talk a little bit about that in a second. But our research questions were these in the first preliminary study, and it was really to test our apparatus. So here we are back uh, about a year ago. Can we measure a change in the biophoton emission from the hands of practitioners before and after energy therapy? Can we measure a change from the hands of patients that they've just treated before and after energy therapy? And can we measure biophotons during the energy healing event itself, all housed in this dark chamber? Now I'll turn it over to Harry who will tell us about his uh, con design and construction of the device. Okay, the, the technical challenge with uh, measuring biophotons are twofold. Uh, first of all, you have to have absolute uh, uh, light tightness. Uh, you cannot afford to have a single photon in stray or it's uh, going to upset your measurement. And we managed to build a chamber that indeed we could get completely light tight and that's what you're seeing here. The second challenge is you have to be able to detect single photons and that's another challenge in itself. And for that we had to use a special photo detector, um, uh, photo multiplier tube that was specially selected for extremely low dark count. Uh, here you see our chamber that we built. Um, it's about four feet by four feet by eight feet and can sit three people and uh, you see the electronics next to it. Here you see an interior, of course, is painted all black. Uh, we have three chairs where uh, Beverly and uh, a healer and a Healy can sit. And the biophoton detector is the black tube that's mounted on this dental lamp, which allows us with six degrees of freedom to move and position the, the detector in any possible way and remain steady there. Remember also that Beverly has to do all of these things in complete and utter darkness. I mean, there, she can't see anything. So that uh, added another dimension of uh, difficulty to it. This is a close-up of the detector. Right now we just strapped it with some broccoli uh, uh, rubber bands there, but it's holding up. The little green LED that you see at the bottom is to calibrate the detector. And we did a test where Beverly could barely, after her eyes were adapted, she could barely see that there was something. And then the detector already registered uh, 16,000 counts per second. So that tells you that how low the intensity of the emitted light is. And we would be below 100 counts per second. Here's a close up. Below, uh, uh, you see the LED, which is actually pointing away from the detector. Right now, we have a cap on it. And this is the detector tube that we used. The SEL stands for selected. They selected for uh, less than 15 counts per second dark count at room temperature. Here uh, we show, obviously, this is not done in light. This is just a, a mock-up, um, how we position the detector to uh, view the third eye. Here, how we view um, the palm of the hand. And that's me with the electronics ne right next to it. We use NIM uh, modules to, to process the data, uh, to process the signals and then use a, a PC to acquire the data. And here's the data where we show what we get um, as dark counts. We first have to, have to establish a baseline. And here we looked at five hours of dark count. You can see um, how um, even uh, the, um, uh, um, the signal is. And mind you, we have to, we have, in order to get good statistics, we have to use an integration time of about two minutes. So we monitor for two minutes acquired data, and then we have a good statistics so that we can average. Oh. As f 
400 to 700 nanometers. Okay, in our first uh, preliminary study, it was a quantitative study with five biofield practitioners of different types, uh, medical Qigong, Reiki, and mixed uh, modalities where they've studied many different types. We had pain patients, and we paired them off, so they weren't couples that knew each other. They were completely novel pairs, and measured them in eight different sessions. I'm only going to discuss a few um, of those sessions. And uh, I was always in there with them, and in some of the latter studies, I realized I had to totally blacken my body. In the early studies, we wore only black clothes, but then I realized even my face was an emitter. So then we needed a black mask, and of course, black leather gloves. Everything was blackened out as much as possible on my body when I was measuring the others, because these photons bounce around and interact. Um, so, and they also had post questionnaires on, their s on the satisfaction with the healing uh, session with relaxation and, and some other things that I'll go over. So the overall procedures are as follows. The practitioner and patient arrive independently. They go through the consent process and complete the demographics questionnaire so we understand more about their background. These were all very experienced healers who had on the average about 19 years of uh, experience practicing their biofield modality. Then uh, they go into the dark chamber with me and the door is shut and sealed. We did have a ventilation system that was sent through baffles so that it didn't add any light to the room, but so we could breathe. Three people in a tiny room sealed would be difficult. Uh, Harry stayed outside and was doing the monitoring and collecting data and we were just speaking to each other through the doors. And then I was going around and placing the detector on different bodily regions of the subjects to count the photons in two minute uh, time periods. And then finally, when we were done, they came out of the box and completed post-session questionnaires related to satisfaction, relaxation, um, et cetera. So um, we needed a little time for the baseline to stabilize once we were in there. Um, and we needed, uh, we took two, me two minutes to measure each bodily region, which gave us very good photon count statistics with a standard deviation of about, of about a tenth of a photon per second. Uh, so it was incredibly physically accurate. And then we put a two-minute baseline between each measurement uh, of a person. Uh, then the practitioner conducted a 20-minute biofield therapy session on the patient. While I put the detector, which was still inside the box, I moved it to the top part of the box so that it might see ambient photons in relation to the healing session. Um, and then, finally, we measured, again, the same bodily regions, usually the palm of the hand, um, and sometimes the sword fingers, which are these two fingers, uh, especially associated with martial arts and qigong, as uh, especially emitters of energy. And then, finally, the subject team out of the chamber completed questionnaires on relaxation, well-being, and satisfaction. The demographics of the healers, um, a range um, in terms of modalities, very experienced, uh, we also asked them whether they thought energy was connected with light, and answers were ranging from uncertain to maybe to yes. Um, following the therapy, we also measured heart rate variability. Uh, the, the low frequency, high frequency ratio is, is related to autonomic nervous system balance, and almost all of those values are good except the one that's 3.177, indicating a little too much sympathetic dominance. But uh, nonetheless, the scores of relaxation, well-being, and satisfaction on a scale from 0 to 10 were all high. So people were happy with the session, even though it was done in a completely dark box. We didn't know how that would feel either. Our patient demographics, um, they were essentially pain patients, and they were also relaxed, uh, felt good, and satisfied with the experiment. They were all women and various ages. So Harry will talk about the, the kinetics, because he did the data analyses. Okay, here we see the raw data as it uh, was acquired uh, from uh, the detector. Uh, in the y-axis you see uh, counts per second, although here it's uh, mentioned as uh, millivolts as it came from our rate meter. But please note um, that we have a signal and then uh, I asked Beverly to remove the photomultiplier to, to get uh, the dark count again and then do another signal again. So because as the baseline changes over the course of an hour, <coughs> uh, we will uh, be able to subtract the, ba the background. And here you can see 
that the HeLa pumps, uh, uh, left and right, or right and left, uh, emitted much more light than the patient pumps. And then we had the healing session where something was happening and we don't know exactly what happened. And afterwards, mm -hmm. we had the healer palms and the patient palms again. But, but I want to point out that during the healing session, there were certain comments made by the practitioner that said, now the energy is flowing. And right then, the, the photons were also being emitted at a higher count, which we felt was significant. Oh, yes, that, that we could actually correlate. That was very interesting in this particular session. Here we have another session. And as you can see, the healer palms are now lower than the patient palms. And this healer was actually having a bad day that day and didn't feel very well. So apparently, uh, the biophoton signal is correlated to um, uh, the well-being of the individual. And the healing session, look, here you can see there's nothing happening except for one spike in the beginning. So it's a completely different flavor, so to speak, of the healing session. And afterwards, we have again the healer palms and the patient palms. Here we have a martial arts um, uh, artist, and he put out the most uh, biophotons. And you can see the sword fingers. In fact, he came up with that idea. He said, I use the sword fingers a lot. And so we said, OK, then let's test it. And indeed, he put out the most light from his sword fingers. That was very interesting. OK, this is a summary of the data. I just want to point out the uh, data in red indicates the emission from the sword fingers, which is higher than, than any of the other, uh, the palms of hands, et cetera. Uh, and that the results really don't show much change before and after healing of healer palms, or sword fingers for that matter, except it's somewhat quieter, less photons after the session. And we didn't really analyze the data coming from uh, during the healing session because the detector was placed above everything and, and it really wasn't our research question. We just wondered if we could count something, but we didn't do an in-depth analysis. Nor did we do statistics on this because it was such a small sample. But just to show you, the trend is post-healing, um, the emission is lower, both patients and practitioners, slightly lower. In another study, we looked at, it was an outcome type of study on three subjects where a practitioner came and performed energy therapy on these people outside of the chamber. And we looked at the patients inside the chamber before they did the energy healing and then once again after they did the energy healing. And this time we not only looked at the palm of the hand, but we looked at what's called in traditional Chinese medicine the three dantians, the forehead, the upper dantian, the heart area, and the abdomen, the lower dantian, uh, which are also minor chakras. Chakras two, four, and six is another way to think about it. Uh, we saw differences between the patients, and it was interesting discussing it with the doctor later. Uh, the people who were the sickest, according to the physician, had the most imbalance in the distribution of light from the three dantians. Um, the palm of the hand is always the highest emitter uh, in most cases, and then the third eye, heart, and abdomen uh, emit less. I'll just go through this quickly. Um, this subject had very low emitting dantians from the three regions. They were barely over the baseline count. Uh, but the palms of the hands were robust and more normal. And um, uh, this is an example of a, a re really unbalanced dantian where the, the third eye is even a higher emitter than the right palm of the hand, which is very unusual from what we've seen. This was a subject who uh, said, I have the ability to open and close my third eye, which is you know, opening and closing intuition, uh, so to speak. And she said, could she do it? Would, she, would we measure it? I said, go ahead, yes. And indeed, we found that in the open condition, which is the last column there, her third eye emitted 51 uh, photons per second whereas when it was closed, it was 34.5. That's highly significant difference. Um, I don't know that we can replicate that. People aren't in the same state from moment to moment, and so that's how it is in biology. But she was very convinced she had been measured in a closed condition and wanted to be measured in an open condition and was very satisfied with this result. We also looked at these patients then before and after biofield therapy, and let me just tell you, the general trend was the energy emission went down and there was also a tendency to balance out the irregularities between the dantians that may have been uh, higher emitters. Now, uh, they, they seem more balanced in the photon emission from all three. Uh, and I'll go through that quickly. So 
Um, all of this relates to the possibility of what goes back to indigenous concepts of a universal life energy which uh, modern science has sidestepped. Uh, the concept of qi from Chinese medicine or qi in Japanese medicine of prana and Ayurveda. Just about every culture had a unique term for this, even all of our Native American cultures. And often we called it the vital force and now we call it the biofield uh, in science. But the metaphysical art showed pictures like this fascinating to look at that. So it's quite possible that the, what we've been measuring is related to something more fundamental to life that's bioregulatory and involved in energy healing. I guess I better stop with that and go to my... Uh, we did a study on cucumbers, but I don't have a time to, to mention, except that organic uh, emitted far less organic cucumbers, far less biophotons than conventionally grown ones although we don't know the ages of the conventionally grown ones because they were purchased, so this may not re reflect anything accurate. Uh, may I just state my conclusions? Thank you. So to conclude, we found distinct differences in biophoton counts for persons that may, may relate to their health status and their abilities to seemingly move energy around their bodies. Um, secondly, the biophoton emission of healers and patients showed a slight decline immediately after energy healing in the two studies. Thirdly, biophoton emission of patients, Dantien's, showed greater balance immediately following energy therapy uh, from a practitioner. And a healthier person also tended to show a greater balance between the emission of the three Dantien's. And finally, organically grown cucumbers emit less light than conventionally grown ones in this short study. Um, we think that the biophoton emission may be part of the biofield of the organism and fundamentally involved in bioregulation according to a hypothesis that I wrote uh, about 12 years ago, the biofield hypothesis, which I can give you the paper reference. And there were very unique energetic signatures to the various biofield therapy sessions. However, we did you know, only eight of these. And we also have a bit of an unreliability since we had only a single detector. In the future, we plan to set up a second detector so that we can monitor both patient and practitioner at the same time and look for coincidence counts and cross correlations between the emissions. And finally, we should really study the same aged cucumbers and maybe grow them all ourselves from the same seed stock. So I'd like to acknowledge the Global Gateway Foundation who funded part of this project and publications of the Biofield Hypothesis and a chapter on the biofield in uh, Lynn Freeman's book. If you're interested, I can mail you those. That's it. We do have time for two very quick questions. Uh, Beverly. I'm wondering, why do you limit uh, this range to the visible range of, of light? Because uh, there's something arbitrary about that. It's just that our eyes can detect it. We try to heal her. We have an infrared camera. It picks up three to five micrometers. Uh, of course, <coughs> we emit lots of uh, infrared light. The healer, emi <coughs> the healer emitted more from her palms than the other people in the lab. Wouldn't it be interesting to expand to other wavelengths? Certainly would. Um, I think we'd, we'd need a, a very expensive uh, detector to do that. It wouldn't be photon counting, then it would be thermal imaging. Uh, but many people are looking you know, at thermal imaging in medicine, and I'm sure we would see uh, something there too. We're looking in this region of the spectrum because uh, there's a history and a lore of bioinformation in these visible photons. Harry, do you want to add? Also, um, uh, that is a very, very good question, and we heard that uh, we are very limited by only looking at um, 700, uh, 400 to 700 nanometers. Now, in our case, we were off on extremely limited funding, and so all we could really achieve for single photon counting, practically, was a photomultiplier, and that simply is limited to that uh, energy range. But absolutely agreed. Uh, we should look into UV, we should look into infrared and far infrared. Thank you. And I, I like to say, I mean, I've always been an advocate of what I call the human energy project, which would be like the human genome project, mapping all the genes of the human. We really need to map all the energies 
emanating from the human body to fully understand this wholly unexplored facet of life, which is completely complementary, by the way, to the particle view, the energy view of life. Uh, Beverly, I have, I have a question. Um, you, your comparisons of before and after uh, with, with healing sessions, uh, those are comparisons of the means. Did you look at variances? Or did you have too few experiments to be able to compute the variance? We had because too few my, experiments. Obviously, experiments. the concern is if the variances overlap, then these mean differences may not be significant. Hmm. What do you think? Uh, I think you, you, have, you, have a very, you have a very good point there. And uh, our, uh, our statistics was very low. So we cannot make uh, much of a meaningful um, uh, conclusion. But what we can say, and this is not scientific, uh, it's just uh, from us to you, is we found that every session has a certain feel to it, a certain, um, how shall I say, a certain um, sentiment, uh, for lack of a better word. It, it, it really is quite different. Each one has its own little fingerprint, and we don't know exactly um, how we can cast that into a scientific language. But if you go to a party and I ask you, so how did you feel about that person or that person and that person, you would say, well, I felt completely different with these people, but I didn't know in what kind of language I should cast it. So it's a little bit like that. So it's almost like it's each session has its own personality. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one question here. Can you discern the frequency of the light emissions? No, uh, we're just simply counting photons. All we know is that they fall in the range of the detectors, uh, 400, 700 nanometers. And I suppose filters could be used. Harry has some ideas about how we might uh, discern the frequency, uh, specific frequencies in that range. Um, we had a problem. Uh, we had to pick a detector that was within our budget. Um, and uh, we had to have one that had extremely low dark, low dark counts, below about 15 counts per second. Anything else would not do because uh, our signal is so low. And that particular detector, I talked to Hamamatsu, but they would not give me an anode output. If they would give me an anode output, then I could run it into a spectrum analyzer. And then we could get a color signal. And I'm trying to convince Beverly to allow me to open it up because I have a screwdriver at home, but so far she has not. <laughs> well, we we're concerned about the detector, if he opens it up, whether it'll work again, of course. But maybe he could take the anode voltage and then we could possibly discern frequency. If you would put some pressure on her, that would work. <laughs> <laughs> They're expensive, these detectors, and we only have, well, we have two now. But still, we could use both of them. Is Thank that you it? very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah.